when there's resistance, there's a saying that says, what you resist persists. And if you don't align with it, if you don't learn to dance with it, if you don't get on the other side of it, like the emotions, it's a message saying that you need to do something about it. Because if all you do is push up against it, it's gonna push back. It starts with a belief that you don't have to go out alone. It starts with the belief you don't have to create it from scratch. There are so many great companies, so many great role models, so many great mentors and coaches who can accelerate that process. Scott, you're very welcome to the ScaleX Insider podcast. Delighted and thrilled to have you on the show today. Thanks, Brandon. Inspired to be here. I appreciate the uh, invitation. Thank you. You're very welcome. It was from a mutual great friend, Elliot Rowe, past guest on the show, who was a wonderful guest. So I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. Uh, we're both very aligned on this. You know, our vision is to inspire, connect, and enable millions of ambitious leaders of small to medium-sized enterprises to scale with purpose. So, Scott, I start the show with this question to all of my guests. What does scaling with purpose mean to you? Oh, it's a great question. Actually, you know, if you, my belief is you don't have purpose, you don't have a target. And if you don't have a target, you're sure to hit it. So, um, yeah, I think there's one thing that a lot of businesses and companies and individuals and entrepreneurs don't understand. And that is they feel like there's a cost associated with becoming more conscious and purposeful and meaningful in, in business. And that's not necessarily the case. In fact, uh, Brendan, there's a study that shows that conscious businesses who are about the people, the planet, the, and uh, in, including profits, um, outperform traditional business 10.5 times to one. And so if that's enough incentive for your listeners to get excited about, you know, being more conscious in their business. I don't know what else there is. So uh, yeah, conscious business with purpose and meaning is a great way to go. And when you're out there to make a difference and make a meaning, I think you'll make a lot of money. Yeah, the money follows, and that's what we found as well. You know, impact first in the context of people and planet. And I wasn't aware of that stat, so thank you. 140 guests in. Uh, that that's a wonderful statistic. So, I'm I'm going to borrow that. That's really really compelling. Um, for those who aren't familiar with your work, Scott, I mean, you have an incredible profile, and I've worked with. Uh, names that that all of our listeners will recognize tony robbins the wonderful late great uh, bob proctor jay abraham if you would can you share with our listeners uh, an abridged version of of your background and how you've come to be doing what you now do well, I was very fortunate, uh, Brendan. I got a hold of a little book that I'm sure many of your listeners have have read, the little book called Think and Grow Rich. <laughs> very and, familiar uh, with it. In that book, it said, you know, you, a lot of people can go out and study and and uh, and work for people. Uh, and But the character in the book went out and became partners with some of the best people in the world. You know, you talk about other people's experiences. You know, the best way to learn is to let them do all the hard work and let their knowledge be collapsed and they and then you get the cliff note version. So uh, very early on, uh, you know, I made a decision one day I was at an event and I saw Tony Robbins speak and I was a trainer for Dale Carnegie at the time. And I saw Tony Robbins speak and I said, you know what, he at the end, he said, I'm going to offer these business training franchises. And I went right to the back of the room, called my realtor, said, sell my house. I'm moving to Cal or moving to California. I was in Ohio at the time in the Midwest of the United States. I'm moving to California to buy a franchise to go work and play with Tony Robbins. And I became a master trainer with Tony, best education of my life. And as you mentioned, then I uh, went on to be on the panel of experts with Jay Abraham and uh, was business partners with Bob Proctor, teaching the, the lawful process or the science behind getting wealthy and rich in your life and your business. Uh, I, I became the managing director for business growth training franchise with um, you know, John Asaraf and others. So yeah, my belief was I, I consider myself, this is going to sound funny, Brendan, but I consider myself a slow learner. And so I used to go do a deep dive and immerse myself. I've been through 26 Date with Destiny programs with Tony Robbins. Now, that was 20 years ago, but guess what? After a while, the joke was that if Tony ever fell off stage, I could complete his sentence, his stories, his interventions. I could do just about anything he could do. Now, I don't want to take anything away from Tony because he's a master. And, um, you know, repetition, reinforcement, uh, those are the things that, that caused us to have uh, a really strong uh, product, great content, and uh, great outcomes and results for our clients. So, uh, yeah, I just became partners with the best in the world, and I gleaned from them, and I put it all together to create a, a different recipe and a different outcome. 
I I really love that. You've spoken directly to the ninth principle of our of our 10 principle scale x framework which is partnerships and we think of some of the best companies in the world uh the likes of S apple steve jobs and steve wozniak uh, hewlett packard ben and jerry's um you know these these incredible organizations are all led by strong partnerships we it's it, something that we encourage those participants on our accelerator program to do, which is actually look at how they can expand their network with no limits. I love the fact that you went straight to Tony Robbins and you know the audacity to do that and then become a close friend and one of his master trainers is just wonderful. Staying on the Tony Robbins theme for a moment because we don't often have somebody who's been as close to him. What makes him a master at what he does? Um, good question. I'll, I'll tell you that, you know, most people think that it's all smoke and mirrors and it's definitely not with Tony. He definitely walks his talk. He is absolutely committed to creating value for others. He'll, um, he has a great saying that, uh, and by the way, sometimes your greatest asset is also your weakest liability. So if you've ever been to a Tony Robbins event, you'll know that it goes well past the ending time, sometimes so the wee hours in the morning. And that's because he his belief is that time serves him. He doesn't serve time. So his one of his powering beliefs is he'll do whatever it takes to get the outcome and the results that he's looking for. He's outcome driven, not time driven. And that's a mistake that a lot of people make. They go, OK, it's time for lunch. It's time for dinner. It's time for happy hour. It's time to, to call it a day. And listen, when you really love what you do, you know, you get up early and you stay up late and those things don't influence or impact you as much as those people who are bored uh, to tears or working for somebody else and they're not. Uh, as you mentioned in the topic, all the passionate about what they do. And I think Tony's middle name is passion. So I think, you know, he lives, he lives what he teaches. He eats his own cooking and he walks his talk. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> he eats his own cooking and he walks his talk. Given what he does and what you now have come to, to create a business from, which is, supporting business leaders to communicate more effectively what what should our leaders know about communication how do they how can they engage their their team their customers more effectively you know people will look at tony robbins and, and he's such a larger than life character that it's very difficult to it's almost too abstract for people but can we take a lot of what Scott DeMullen and, and, and Tony Robbins and these incredible communicators do and, and bring it into our day-to-day -day, uh, roles as business leaders? Brilliant question. In fact, what you just did is exactly what Tony's best at, and that's he's best at asking great questions. And I think, you know, there's a difference between a lot of people get stuck in what they know and when you, when you, I, I say knowing leads to confrontation and curiosity leads to creativity. And when you live in a state of curiosity, that means you're looking for alternatives. You're looking for solutions. But if you're, if you, if you have to defend what you know, you stay stuck and you can't, you know, go beyond that. And, you know, it really comes down to what you're doing, Brendan. It comes down to staying in a state of curiosity, continue your learning process. And I think, uh, you know, I think you'd agree and I think your listeners would agree that we are in a massive state of change in this world with the advent of AI, with the new, th new information and technology that's hitting the world. There's a, a statistic that says 90% of the world's data was created in just the past three years. Now, if you think about that, that's a lot to digest. That's a lot of new information. And if you don't stay on the cutting edge of learning and growing and, and working with coaching and mentoring, it's tough to keep pace. And you don't have to do it all yourself. You can let your coaches and mentors help you get there. Uh, one of my favorite quotes was by Eric Hoffer, who said that in times of change, which we're definitely going through, in times of change, the learners will inherit the earth, while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to live in a world that no longer exists. 
And I don't think there's ever been a time that's more true, that statement's more true than it is today with the massive advent of change and data and learning and uh, what's coming down the pike. And there's, there's, I think you'll agree that learning also takes confidence. And if you have too little confidence, you don't think you can learn. And if you have too much confidence, you don't think you have to. And both of those labels, if you will, are traps. Because if you don't have the confidence, you don't stretch yourself, you don't commit, you don't, you know, buy in to the growth and learning process. Because the truth is, you know, people don't mind change. They don't like to be changed. And so if you can, if you can embrace change, if you can get excited about change and, you know, AI has been, there is this dark monster that's coming down the path. AI is not going to put the world out of business, but it is going to change how you do business. And if you don't embrace it, you may be, uh, you know, obsolete, if you will. So you want to embrace change. You want to embrace learning and you want to stay on that path because if you don't, you're going to be stuck in an old paradigm that no longer exists. Yeah, that's so profound. There's a number of things in that that I want to pick up on. With all of this information available to us, let's just take how to scale a business. If you type it in now, I did this this morning because I was I doing a presentation for, for a group of uh, CEOs. And when you type how to, to scale a business into Google, it returns over 1.8 billion search terms in 0.3 seconds. Yeah. How do you navigate through all of that noise? Given your four decades of experience, you've worked with some of the the the, the most well-known organizations on the planet, Scott. What do you see or what do you know about scaling a business in terms of the fundamentals? What what do our listeners need to be honed in on to really cut through the noise? Uh, that is the, the, the massive amount of data that is available to us that, that, can, that can really detract for, and distract from what we're trying to do. I said, you know, knowledge isn't power. It's, it's applied knowledge that's really power. So, so what should our listeners be focused on in terms of the application of the vast amount of knowledge that's, that's out there? Well, it starts with a belief that you don't have to go out alone. And it starts with the belief you don't have to create it from scratch. There are so many great companies, so so many great role models, so many great mentors and coaches who can accelerate that process. The key is you want to find uh, the right person to work with. The right, you know, for example, you know, we've coached and mentored 500 different companies. Now, when we walk into a new company, it's very easy for us to identify uh, challenges, hiccups, roadblocks, speed bumps. Uh, and most importantly, breakthrough ideas. And just like you do with your clients, it's easy because you've seen it before and bef uh, again and again. So modeling is a great uh, a dictator of success. Find someone who's doing what you want to do, model their beliefs, their strategies, their physiology, their policies, their procedures, et cetera. Um, and I'm going to take it one step further because I have a belief, Brendan, that um, the, your business and your market is, is like a metaphorical iceberg, if you will. And if that iceberg represents the entirety of your marketplace, the challenge with most businesses, if you, if I ask you the question, uh, and I'll, I'll ask you, what percentage of the iceberg is above waterline? 30%. It's actually much less than that. Give or take, it's about 10 or 11%. It's a very small percentage because of the weight of the iceberg, most of it is below the waterline as the Titanic found out. And, you know, being from Ireland, it's where the ship was built, right? Um, but, you know, most of that iceberg is below the waterline. Here's what you just said that was really valuable. And that is that if you look at the top 10% of your entirety of your market, that 10% represents your customers who are either buying now or they're open to buying meaning they're out there looking for your product or they've gone to trade shows or they've gone on social media, they've done some search and they're being retargeted uh, and they're being uh, just bombarded by noise and clutter and purchasing opportunities. So the challenge is most companies go after that 10%, but it's the, it's the most noisy and cluttered percentage of the marketplace. 
because they're the ones that are being, you know, your competitors are out there, you know, marketing to them too. And my belief is that the competing is the most expensive way to grow your business. And there's another saying that what you, uh, in competition, what you fight to get, you have to fight to keep. My belief that in, that in that second 7%, the top three to 5% are buying now, the next 7% are like open to buying. And then you have the waterline. Below that waterline, Brennan, is the 30% of the population that is not aware of you, your product, your service, your opportunity. And there's a 30% below that who may be aware of it, but they don't truly understand it. They don't know why it uh, is necessary. They don't know how it solves their problems. So if you look at the 60%, the combined 60% that's below that waterline, that's your ideal client. That's your target. And there's a couple of reasons why. This is also one of the reasons why, you know, we invest so much time and resources into teaching our leaders and our entrepreneurs public speaking skills, because instead of an advertisement that has about a 3.2 second shelf life, even less in digital marketing, you have a, um, an audience, a captive audience who you're speaking to. And it could be a 15 minute, you know, Ted style talk. It could be a 30 minute or 90 minute keynote, or it could be a, an all day training or a weekend seminar. But you have a captive audience. And in order to captivate that 60% below the waterline, there's a saying in our business that awareness precedes understanding and understand precedes change. So if people are aware of you, then you need to educate them so that they have an understanding. And now they're going to vote their dollars and change their buying habits, change their lifestyle, change their investment or relationship or business strategies and habits. So what's great about that is that when you communicate directly to those people, you're now enrolling them for their reasons, not trying to convince them to buy for yours. We call it enrolled, not sold. How do you enroll your clients so they get excited for their reasons to solve their problems and, 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 and move towards solutions that you provide them, not feeling like that you're, you're uh, you know, pushing them to buy or you're doing a stack close that manipulates the heck out of them. Those are tactics. But if you can get them, like you said in the beginning of the call, to buy for their reasons, their purpose, their mission, their reasons, there you're going to have less buyer's remorse. You're going to have more buy-in. And when you educate, and that's where this is where education-based sales comes in, when you educate them to the value and the reason behind why they need to have this product or your solution, you now elevate them above the waterline in the metaphor of the iceberg. And what's great about it is that they perceive you as a credible, trustworthy authority or expert because you're the one who's on the platform and you're the one who created awareness and understanding as to why they needed to read your book, take your program, you know, apply your product or solution. And what's great about it is because you have the relationship and the affinity with them. There's no clutter, there's no noise, and there's no competition. So that's what makes you stand out. And, and you know, a lot of people, a lot of entrepreneurs say, well, I'm wearing so many hats. How do I work smarter and not harder? Well, that's one of the ways. Stop competing in the noisy, cluttered marketplace, you know, that of the people who are buying now or open to buying who are being, you know, massively retargeted. And how do you educate and enroll people for their reasons by creating awareness and understanding of your product, your service, and your solution? Most importantly, that message has to be a message that solves their problem. And that problem is either one they're aware of and they don't know how to solve, or you make them aware of it because they are missing the boat, if you will, because they don't realize it's a problem they have and they're not working on. So in the very beginning, you create awareness that they have a problem and you ask them questions that cause them to be dissatisfied with wherever they're at, their clients, their leads, their health, their relationships, their finances. This is what I call agitate, don't irritate. You want to agitate them so they become dissatisfied with their current wherever they're at and, and cause them to aspire or be inspired about getting to where they want to go. So I know there's a lot to unpack there. There's a lot of information there, uh, but that's that's my answer to your question. <laughs> there's so much in this. 
uh, I've got a list of questions that I'm now just going to kind of park and and dive deeply into to what you've just said. I'm going to come back to the the public speaking and and that as a medium to communicate your message. Yeah. It's something personally I'm interested in. Um, I am a keynote speaker, and I'm so I'm going to indulge myself at the end to to get the benefit of your wonderful experience. I'm conscious that not all of our listeners will be uh, ready, willing, comfortable with actually going on to a platform to to deliver a message about what they do in the context of educating their potential clients around a problem that they know they have or making them aware of a problem that they don't know they have that has been that has been holding them back in the context of their own business so let's get it because i love this terminology i love this language educate and enroll beyond the the platform you know of liter- literally the 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 stage in front of hundreds of people what else can our listeners do practically to actually engage with their with their potential clients with engage uh, under the waterline to get to that 60% uh, over and above kind of going on to a stage can we can we get super practical with some of the other things that our listeners can do. Absolutely, Brendan. And the uh, the iceberg metaphor works in your marketing, in your communications, and in sales as well. So they don't have to be a speaker. Uh, and one of the great, um, I guess the best question to ask is, are you educating and enrolling and creating awareness and understanding, or are you selling convincing? So in your marketing, in your messaging to your clients, whether it's your social media or your website or your your sales and marketing collateral, are you trying to convince with facts, features, and benefits, which is how most people do it? Or are you inviting them to become aware of challenges and issues? Now, you and I have both used a couple of statistics on this call already. And my belief is that uh, when you educate your client, you know, my belief is people will pay more for an expert than they will for a salesperson. And if you educate them, they now can make a decision for their reasons as opposed to, you know, trying to sell them as a salesperson. So you can use, I would challenge your listeners, whether they're a business owner, entrepreneur, or salesperson, go out and research their market. They need to know about more about their market and the data in their marketplace than they knew they need to know about their product and their um, facts, features, and benefits. Product data is not nearly as important as market research or market data. Uh, I had a client and uh, she came to me about 10, 12 years ago and she had a product and it was all natural rodent repellent, which, you know, kept mice and rats out of your house. Now she was approved by the environmental protection agency. She, it took her two years to get that. She was, you know, she was using these facts of, of safe for the environment, safe for children, non-toxic, really great product. She was, she was spinning her wheels. And I said, you need to stop talking about your product and trying to convince people of the value and start educating them on the pain, the market and the problem that that consumer possibly has. So I brought her here to Las Vegas. I taught her how to, to speak on the platform. I taught her how to do interviews. We did media training for her. And I gave, I came up with some statistics and research and your listeners can do the same. Go use chat GPT and find out what is the, what are the trends in their marketplace? What is the research, especially trends over the time, by the way. And I simply created for her some data and information. For example, you know, did you know that there's 1.8 million house fires every single year or every 10 years here in the United States? Now, what you may not know is that 8% of those house fires are started by mice and rats chewing through the electrical wiring in the house infrastructure somewhere. Now, notice what you're doing right now. You're shaking your head no, you're going wow. And we call that a wow statement because that creates awareness and teaches your client, educates them at the same time of the problem they didn't even realize they had. Now, what parent is going to want to put their family in jeopardy by exposing their children to the potentiality of a house fire? 
We also know that there's 300 to 600,000 mice and rat bites annually, most to children and the elderly. There are 35 known diseases that mice and rats carry. One is hantavirus, which is an often fatal lung disease. So, and, and, and people say, well, I've only got signed one or two mice in the house. It's not a big deal. They're cute. I, they don't bother me. Most people don't feel that way, but they don't bother me. But did you know that a single pair of mice, if they have access to food, water, and shelter, gone unchecked, are more prolific than rabbits? In fact, they can create as many as 5,000 offspring a single year. Scott, where can I get this product? <laughs> <laughs> See, what you're doing is you're, you're, you're causing them to salivate for your product, your service, your coaching, your consulting, whatever it is you do, you're causing them to salivate for their reasons because it's solving or addressing a problem they either have or didn't know they have. And now you're not trying to convince them with it's EPA certified, it's safe for the environment. You're causing them to lean in and get excited for your solution and asking for your solution as opposed to you trying to convince them for your solution. Does that all make sense? It makes complete sense. And you speak again directly to the seventh principle of our Scalex framework, which is proposition. And I remember things, just the way my brain works, I remember things typically in acronyms. So when we wrote our book, Simple Scaling, I used the acronym VALUE to really reaffirm what you've just spoken about, Scott. VALUE being an acronym for V is the vagueness kills. So if you're unsure about what your actual proposition, what you, what value you bring, then you're just going to uh, you're going to just create noise in the marketplace. Nobody's actually going to stand up and hear you. Uh, the A stands for alleviate the pain. And ultimately, that's about making people aware that there's pain. Pain actually exists if they're not already aware that pain exists exactly to your point. The L is leverage again. For some luxury items, it's about bringing an, an emotional gain. You're, you know, why do people pay thousands of dollars for handbags whenever they, you know, they can walk into a shop and and you get a carrier bag for free and both offer the same kind of provide the same utility in the context of uh, the same functionality in the context of the whole stuff but uh, so the, the fact the luxury item brings a, an emotional gain so leverage that gain the U is understanding it from the customer's perspective and then the E is 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 evangelizing the customer's tone that's that's what we we talk about in the context context of value. Um, I love that. Uh, there's there's lots in that. And I'm going to I'm going to pivot slightly because you've got me now um, focused on statistics and I'm going to share a statistic with you. There are 5.7 million small to medium sized enterprises in the UK alone. Yeah. And uh, they contribute 2.3 trillion pounds worth of revenue to the UK economy. So it's significant. Half of that, or sorry, more than half of that, 1.3 trillion pounds worth of revenue on the, the latest research, which the 2023 research, is contributed by half a percent of those SMEs, 28,000 companies, and those are the scale-ups. And that's why our entire purpose is to inspire, connect, and enable ambitious leaders of SMEs to scale with purpose because they're contributing positively disproportionately to to not only their their own organizations but communities society economies at at at, at large now an interesting statistic is that lack of ambition of the leader is cited as the single greatest impediment as to why companies don't scale now it would be remiss of me given a man who has marinated in the, the work of Tony Robbins and Bob Proctor and Jay Abraham for, for decades, not to inquire as to what can leaders do in the context of mindset, because lack, ambition is a mindset. It basically says, I, I have been driven towards success I've achieved a certain amount of success and now I won't, don't want to do any more. And I, don't, I feel that actually lack of ambition is a nice way of saying I have unchallenged limiting beliefs. Mm -hmm. So given 
your experience, Scott, what have you found in the context of the mindset of the leader, which has really led, which has really held leaders back from doing something great in the context and making a greater impact in the world? Satisfaction. I know that sounds simple. And I like the fact you make it simple for your people, by the way, because, you know, most people are silently begging to be led. And I love the fact that you have acronyms and make things simple. I, I told you, I think earlier that, that uh, I have a difficulty learning when I was young. And so uh, I didn't consider myself that smart. So is, is, if I could take complex ideas like you're doing and make them simple to digest and understand and communicate them, that's one of the ways. Um, I think that, you know, when we talk about communication, communication happens first and foremost with yourself. Internal, internal dialogue. Second, in, with your team, with your staff and so forth. Then next with your customers and clients. Next with your marketplace. Next with the community as a whole. And communication is very critical. Most people don't understand, nor do they study communication. Uh, I think, uh, you know, being the most famous investor in, in, in the world, if definitely here in the United States, is Warren Buffett. And Warren Buffett said that if you invest in yourself, you know, most people look at how do I invest in, in, in a business or uh, a stock or something, and they're constantly riding the wave, the roller coasters of up and downs. But if you invest in yourself, it's a continually up level ride. You continually grow. And that's why people come and play with you, Brandon. And that's why they need mentors and coaches. But if you invest in yourself, he said that you can easily, well, first of all, it's going to, you're going to penalize yourself for the next 50 to 60 years as a student if you don't. And he said, you can easily improve your, your, net, your net worth by 50% or more just by learning communications flat out. And that means, you know, your verbal and written communications, as well as your public speaking communications, very important. Now, I'll tell you why. And when I said satisfaction, when you, when you asked that question, part of the reason that um, when I talk about agitate, don't irritate, if your if you're client or the business owner is satisfied with where they're at. You know, if they like who cuts their hair, if they like the car they're driving, if they like the body style they have and the, the weight that they're at, uh, they like their financial portfolio, they will not change. So if you want to inspire them, you must agitate them, not irritate them. There's a big difference. You want to agitate them to the point where they and ask them questions like, what's it going to cost you if you don't grow your business? What are you going to miss out on uh, time with your family if you don't, you know, automate or, you know, get things in the system and make them system dependent and not dependent on you as the leader? So the, the most important thing you can do is ask them questions that cause them to feel the discomfort of not changing. So, you know, we talk about people staying in their comfort zone. And if something appears outside their comfort zone, they move towards it. And as soon as it becomes too uncomfortable, they go back to where they're satisfied, happy, and comfortable. And what happens is this thing that's outside their comfort zone doesn't disappear. It doesn't go away. In fact, it probably appears in other areas of their life. But once they go out and they grow and they learn and they deal with that issue, their comfort zone expands to the point where anytime that comes up, it's now inside their comfort zone. And that's why learning and growing and staying abreast of change is so critically important. And, uh, you know, it, it, you got to get used to being uncomfortable. People usually resist and push away discomfort. And the truth is we're only happy when we're growing and learning. And discomfort is a byproduct or an effect or a symptom of that. And so if you're not uncomfortable, you should be. <laughs> you need to get uncomfortable because that's like when you go to the gym, if you lift a weight, it's uncomfortable the first couple of times. After a while, it becomes secondary. So now you need to change to a, a higher weight or a different exercise that caused you to be uncomfortable in your body or your organism or your business. So yeah, satisfaction is one of the biggest uh, you know, passion killers in the world. We call those, we've characterized five different types of leaders. One of those is the scale X leader who actually is in love with their business, is in love with the potential that exists in the world for them to make a greater impact. They're, they're passionate advocates of the, um, and implementers of the, the 10 principles. But the, the four leaders, one of the four leader types who don't scale, we, we term them the comfort zone warrior. 
So it it is that leader who has arrived at a place where they've they've ticked off all of the boxes, all of the all of the things that they wanted to achieve, which are typically noted by society as being attributable to someone who is successful, the house, the car, the holidays, the second home, all of that good stuff. When they arrive there, it's a dangerous place. And I think, and I've been reflecting on this lately, I think they fall foul of wanting to look good rather than being good. And I'm interested, let's just riff on this for a little while because you have so much experience in this. What are some of the questions that we can ask of ourselves if there are people listening who, you know, are maybe slipping into this comfort zone place? Um, What are some of the questions that we can ask of ourselves and indeed ask of others to to agitate and not irritate to get them to to move beyond the comfort zone? Yeah, I absolutely love what you just said. And I'm not just doing it to patronize you. We ask each and every one of our clients in the, in the audit phase, for lack of a better term, before we even agree to work with them. And the question is, Brendan, do you want to look good or do you want to be good? And you and I both know there's a huge chasm and delta between the two. And this day and age, just about anybody can look good. They can put up a flashy website or social media campaign uh, or, you know, landing page, whatever it is, anybody can look good. The question is, when it comes time to deliver your product, your service, your coaching, your training, whatever it is your product is, can you deliver? And I would say, twist it around a little bit. Um, My question is, how can you be good without looking good? Now, that, that kind of makes people fuzzy. It's it's important to have social media. But I can tell you, and this is going to sound crazy to some of your listeners, I have, the reason I've stayed below the radar most of my four decades in business is that I've never really marketed or advertised. I've based my growth on one principle, and that is that with every client, with every speech, with every product or interaction that I have with someone, I will replace it with two more. Meaning if I go out and do a, a talk, my goal, Brennan, is to provide so much value, content, inspiration, motivation, excitement that they either or bring me into their company or they refer me to their wife or their spouse or their husband's company. Or they uh, three years later and they say, Scott, I heard you on a speech in LA. Uh, my company's ready. I want to, I want to come work with you. So My belief is this, is that your reputation and your character are significantly more important than any looking good, any influencer, any social media post, anything that you can put online. And if you don't back it up with character and reputation, if you have an acceptable body count, and I I, I encourage them not to, but I know people, as many of the influencers I know who um, on, you know, on the face look good. I I know one couple who's flying around first class, they're drinking champagne, they're in the first class lounges, and they owe other people tens of thousands of dollars. That's not being good. And if you can base your marketing on your reputation, you and I have something in common. We have an NPS score of 100%, 10 out of 10. And that's the thing I'm most proud of. I'm committed to making sure that we deliver significant value, 10 out of 10 experience. So your listeners need to ask themselves, what am I doing uh, to, to be good? And the look good will follow. There's cause and effect. Being good is the cause. Looking good is the effect. And most people have it backwards. You know, they say, if I look good, that's the cause. No, that's the effect. So you want to be good and that's going to cause you to look good and you'll never have to spend a lot of money in social media and marketing and advertising and promotions. It just doesn't happen. Yeah, I love that. You brought me back to to Bob Proctor's wonderful work there from which he leveraged from Thurman Fleet, which is the stick man, which, you know, yeah, yeah. as we think determines how we feel, determines how we act, determines the results that we get. And this call circumstances, environments and results. Yeah, yeah. And I, I had never considered actually the, 
uh, looking good is the effect of being good. And in this context, in the context of scaling our businesses with purpose, what we want to do is uh, over deliver in the context of value. And that can only be done when we are, we're forensic with getting to understand our customers, our clients, pains and, and needs. Some of them are aware of them, others we've got to make them aware. Um, and you've given a great example. Well, if I can, if I can jump in on that, because, you know, Bob said something very powerful because, you know, in our conscious mind, that's where our wants happen and our subconscious mind, that's where our paradigms and our beliefs happen. And we filter our wants through our subconscious. And then we take action, which produces the circumstances, circumstances, the conditions, the environments and the results. Here's the important part. When I ask you or I ask people who are sitting in the audience and they ask, what is your product? Now, for most listeners in here, if you're an entrepreneur, the product is not the widget, it's not the service, it's not the program. It's you. It's you as a, a business owner, as an entrepreneur, it's your product. And the most important product is the feeling you leave with your customer, period. And what's so important is that the product is the commodity they walk out the door with. The real product is the feeling they have because of their relationship with you or because they invested in the product or service that you have. So just like when we talk about public speaking or your marketing, it's it's the feeling you leave with your audience that is going to dictate them voting with their dollars. Yes, no, or maybe. And a lot of people are so, I love the fact that there's a lot of heart-centered entrepreneurs out there. Here's the challenge. If you're heart-centered, you, you tend to be nice. You pretend not to know if you look that up in the dictionary. I'm going to challenge them to be kind. And that is sometimes you have to ask them tough questions, which are uncomfortable, which are going to cause them to be dissatisfied and agitate them a little bit to cause them to have a feeling of desire, of inspiration, of wanting to be, do, or have more. So desire means of the father. It means to, you know, to want to grow. So um, one of the most important things you can do is leave them with the feeling of, and by asking them questions and you say, what are you going to miss out on? What is it going to cost you? What's the, if you're sitting on the porch and rocking chair when you're 65 or 75 years old, what did you miss out on? Because you didn't write that book because you didn't contribute or create that product or program or service, or you didn't spend time, more time with your family. That's going to cause them to feel inspired to make sure they do those things before they end up in the rocking chair, you know, at, at, in the retirement of ages of their life. So asking tough questions, I, I call it getting them off their unfounded fear. And quite honestly, you have a moral obligation to do that. And you're doing them a disservice by not asking those tough questions. So you got to ask them questions that cause them to be dissatisfied with their current whatever bank account health relationship and cause them to desire to be do and have more something we coach on is a, a practice to to get comfortable with being uncomfortable i became a wim hof method instructor some years ago i was Damn. just profoundly impacted with the method and uh, i spent some time with wim and and we now coach this and not uh, not because, uh, you know, it just seems everybody's doing ice baths now, but uh, yeah. this, this is something that, that is practical and that supports our leaders in actually calming their nervous system to deal with discomfort in a way that's, that's productive and to actually get into the, the habit of getting comfortable with being uncomfortable what are some of the fears? So we've discussed kind of that fear of discomfort. Um, what are uh, what are some of the other fears, Scott, that you've seen in in your four decades of of working with business leaders? That you know, if there's a menu of them, what are the top three or five? Just to make our listeners aware, because uh, again, I'm conscious we use language like you know, limiting beliefs, but people might be hearing this term for the first time and not even be aware that 
um, that their belief system matters or their belief system can be changed or there's or, or there's a, a kind of uh, there's a there's there's a, a subconscious element of play here in the context of their paradigm which is influencing how they how they go about leading their business so yeah just just call out some of the fears if you would well, I'm going to, you know, rather than just giving them a fish, let's teach them how to fish. Brilliant. Um, <laughs> Even better. I say, let's go a little bit deeper. And uh, I have a belief that, you know, the label you put on your experience becomes your experience. But rather than letting that limiting belief or that label dictate how you respond in your efforts or your work or your sales or what have you, let's evaluate the message that that label is really sharing with you. Now you talk about fears like limiting beliefs. If you look up fear in the dictionary, fear simply means that you're about to do something or engage in that you don't feel prepared for. People are afraid to start their business. People are afraid of selling. Uh, people are afraid of public speaking. Now, if you look at that, if you're not one of those people who has a desire to public speak because you have a fear fear of it or to sell, it just means that you're what you're saying is that you you feel like you're about to do something you're not prepared for. So I'm curious, what would happen if you were prepared to have that sales interaction? What would happen if you were prepared to get up in front of a group of five people in a boardroom and engage and enroll them? And simply means that preparation, uh, you know, it's it, fear is a fight or flight feeling, and we want to look at. Uh, fear and other emotions, emotions as a guidance system, kind of like a GPS. And there's a message behind that. Fear means you're about to do something you're not prepared for. Anger means that you have rules and somebody has violated your rules. Guilt means that you have rules for yourself, like working out or not smoking or not eating too much, and you violated your own rules. So if you go deeper and identify what is the emotion and what's the message it's sending to us, then you can be prepared in any situation or you can understand, you know, the negative response and we, whether you call it intuition or emotions, um, that negative message is telling us something that we need to act on or be aware of. And if you're not aware of it, you don't understand it, you'll stay stuck in it. And that's where, you know, significant emotional experiences or PTSD experiences at a young age can literally throttle, you know, or keep people limited for the rest of their life. So you want to make sure that you understand the emotional message behind it. Um, yeah, there's, there's many of things that people are afraid of. And I would say, uh, look at the definition of fear and say, if I'm afraid of it, how can I prepare myself? You know, get the best support resources, practice, drill, rehearse, whatever it is that you need to cause yourself to feel prepared. And that's where modeling other people's beliefs, strategies, physiology, get a coach, get a mentor, uh, you know, whatever it is to help guide you through that. That's why the best athletes and the best business owners and the best thought leaders in the world have coaches. They have mentors so they can circumvent and navigate something that they might be afraid of doing on their own and therefore, you know, constrict and fall back into old paradigms as opposed to pushing and moving forward. I know I'm going to be replaying the last few minutes over and over and over again. <laughs> that was absolutely brilliant. So what we're encouraging our listeners to think about is that where they're experiencing resistance at the moment is to really feel into that and to appreciate that actually their greatest growth opportunity potentially comes at the other side of that resistance. Mm -hmm. Is that fair to say? Yeah. And I think um, <laughs> we talked about, you know, your, your, your comfort zone, if you will. Uh, when there's resistance, there, there's a saying that says what you resist persists. <laughs> and if you don't align with it, if you don't learn to dance with it, if you don't, you know, get on the other side of it, like emotions, it's a message saying that you need to do something about it. Because if all you do is push up against it, it's going to push back. You know, oftentimes when I'm on stage, I'll walk into the audience and I'll say, you know, can you put up your hand? And what's really interesting, Brendan, is when I put my hand against theirs and I push against their hand, what do they do? Resisted. Natural human nature tendency is to push back. 
Now, I didn't tell them to push back, but as soon as I start to push against them, they push back. And that's why pushy sales people get resistance. That's why, you know, actually resistance in bodybuilding or lifting creates, you know, uh, bigger muscles, bigger ability to, you know, get healthy and, and build your body. So resistance is a powerful motivator. And I think we need to learn work with it and, and instead of resist it, because it's only going to, it's only going to get bigger. Something you mentioned there is public speaking and the the fear of public speaking glossophobia is a fear worse than death for most people <laughs> it's a real fear given your extensive experience scott and the fact that we're encouraging our leaders to get out there to represent their companies their brand and shine a spotlight on a on a challenge that they're facing that they may not even be aware that they're facing that's holding them back. This speaks also to the work of a previous guest, Daniel Priestley, who wrote Daniel a wonderful Daniel. book called <laughs> Key Person of Influence. And 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 he's Daniel's a wonderful guy like yourself, Scott. Um, so so impact focused, so grounded, but just so wise. And uh this is speaking to his key person of influence uh, pitch for people to get out in front of their brands, to yeah. uh, to represent the brands, to put a face to the brand. What would you say to people? And let's get let's get super tactical here. Um, I suspect lots listening will will be resisting getting out there, getting on to social media, um, putting their face on social media, starting to, uh, to put content out there, starting to uh, put some vlogs out there, whatever it may be, and uh, even prior to getting on, on a stage in front of hundreds of people. What can people do practically to, to start to, 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 to seed some confidence that ultimately will uh, make them wonderful communicators in the context of what they're trying to to sell. Well, I'm glad. I appreciate the introduction to that that content and that topic because you hear so many of your leaders and speakers and not speakers, your your leaders and business owners who are saying, you know, how do I make a bigger difference? How do I do more with less? And if you really want to get leverage on the time, talent, and resources that you possess, stop meeting one-to-one. -one. Now, listen, one of my dear friends is Ivan Meisner, who's the founder of BNI, and, and you want to get out there and network. I wholly endorse that. At some point, it's critical that you go one-to-many. And what does that mean? That means five people in a boardroom or 500 people in, a, in, a, in an event. And most people have a misunderstanding as to what specifically public speaking means. And public speaking just means that you're you're leveraging your time, your talent, and your resources to talk to a group of people. Now, I'll give you an example. You don't have to be some slick presenter. You don't have to be a, a coach or a consultant getting in front of a or, or be a paid keynote speaker. Many of my most successful clients, Bren, Brendan, are what I call blue collar businesses. I'll give you an example. This is going to blow your mind. Commercial painting company, how could public speaking possibly help them? So a commercial painting company, they go out and paint multifamily homes, apartments, condos, et cetera. And um, who's their ideal client? And that's one of the first questions your people want to find. Who is my ideal client? Where do they hang out? You know, what organizations do they belong to? How can I become an authority uh, or an expert and contribute uh, as a credible expert to that group? So Two brothers, Northern California, or excuse me, uh, North San Diego County came to me and said, Scott, we need some help growing our business. They were a small business. They were about $2.2 million. And I said, okay, let's teach you some communication skills, which is very important. Let's teach you some sales and engagement skills. Then let's teach you to speak in public and you go, whoa, slow down. How do I, what does that have to do with painting? And I said, what doesn't it? And I said, who's your ideal client? And they said, well, we have to go pitch to the 
homeowners associations who are making a decision which of the three contractors they've been presented with by the property management company to go pitch them on who's going to get the bid for hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I said, so who's your client? And they said, well, I think it's the homeowners association. I said, nope. I said, it's the property management company. And they go, what do you mean? Well, the property management company is the one that, that, that um, filters and identifies the, the, the contractors that they're going to put in front of the board, the homeowners association board. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to do something simple, old school called lunch and learn. You're going to go to these uh, property management companies that have 10, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 people that work there that represent all of the potential clients in that market. And I want you to go grab some lunch for them, bring them in and say, we're going to give you some education over the next 30 minutes. Now, instead of focusing on facts and features, like, you know, when you paint this way, it lasts longer than if you paint that way. That doesn't matter. That's a fact. Uh, we're a family owned business. We're really proud of ourselves. We're three generations. Nobody cares. So what do you focus on? You focus on before you get in front of any audience, whether it's marketing or sales or speaking, you need to know what are their biggest needs and wants. So you want to identify the needs and wants of the property management company, first and foremost, and then the property, excuse me, the, the homeowners problems and challenges, needs, wants, and issues. What are they afraid of? What do they need? What are they concerned about? So I, I help them create a talk to go in front of this, these property management companies. And I said, here's their biggest problems that, and I, we identified five of the biggest problems and we shared, we're pretty aware of your problems. You know, uh, you don't have time in, uh, to to respond to problems on the properties. You've got Mrs. Kravitz who's sitting at the end complaining about every time the gate is left open or the bushes aren't covered when there's painting that's happening. So find out what their problems are and then give them the solution. And we have to help them create. This is what I mean by market data research versus product. Instead of talking about painting, they're talking about how can we create a calendar for the homeowners association so they know what are the stages of painting that is going to happen and we're solving the problems for the property manager so they don't have to answer phone calls and go back and forth for when is the painting going to happen when is the pool going to be closed when are the car is not going to be able to be parked in the front parking lot see we're solving little problems that have nothing to do with painting but that's what's going to piss off the homeowners and so we created something called iCal we created something called uh job scope so we created and we labeled, put a name to the solution, and we went in and taught them how to engage and enroll and solve the problems of the property manager. Now, here's what happened. Before that, they were getting invited to about one in five pitches, meaning they would say, uh, hey, have you got a job? We'd like to be you know, put forward, put forth to the, pro the property owners, and they would get one in five. After we taught them how to do these lunch and learns for property management companies. They were getting invited to two out of three because now they're the expert. People would say, oh, I need that help. You're the perfect person. Can you go do a scope of work for this project and come back and report to me? Now they became the lead contractor to present or to create the scope of work, which is now being presented to the other contractors. They had to go by their scope of work. Now they're comparing apples to apples and they're the authority or the expert. That means they understand, they're aware of, they bring them above the waterline. Now we taught them how once they got in front of the property owners, the homeowners association board, how to pitch and engage and enroll them. And to collapse this into a real quick uh, story, they did $2.2 million the year before I worked with them. And by teaching them just this process, I get a call about 60 days after we taught Kirby and Tony how to do this. And Kirby calls him one day and he's in his car. He goes, Scott, I effing love you. And I go, what are you talking about? He goes, our biggest our big sell before was like $320,000 or something. He goes, I just closed a deal for $720,000. He calls me a month later, Brendan. I just closed a deal for 900 and some thousand. He calls me a month later. I just closed a deal for 1.2 million. They did in the next five months, $5.5 million worth of business. 
not because they were better painters, not because of the facts, not because of the type of paint they used, not because of the direction of the paint, because they could communicate, because they could speak, and because they could identify the problems and needs and wants and situations that both the property managers had and the homeowners had, and it created a bigger problem for them. They got so much business that they had to hire people, buy more paint, buy more products. They had to go out and factor their contracts to get the money to front load the services that they had just sold. Oh, I, so, abs I absolutely love that. I love that. I, I have no doubt and I'm confident that, that our listeners are going to F and love you too, Scott. Uh, <laughs> you've delivered you. so much value in the last hour. I'm conscious of time and given your incredible experience, the, the, the network of, of incredible people that you've, that you've deliberately surrounded yourself with. And in many respects, I, I feel, you know, they've, 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 uh, using the iceberg analogy, what we've seen is them above the waterline and it's Scott de Moulin who's been below the waterline here in terms of supporting a lot of those high profile individuals that, that uh, our listeners will be very, very familiar with. Given your four decades of experience with, with entrepreneurs, leaders, business owners across the globe, could you share with our listeners three timeless takeaways? Wow. Uh, there's many of them. Uh, let's, let's see if we can uh, narrow them down to three. I say first and foremost, stay curious, stay coachable, stay committed. If, if I work with a client and they're not those three things, I refuse to engage with them because I know there's going to be some fallout. So go through life and say, and start up conversations with I'm curious and then ask great questions. Instead of defending what you know, stay curious so you can be creative and and you know work with other people and, and expand and grow. Number two, you know the E Myth, Michael Gerber. I know you're familiar with it. You know, work on your business, not in it. There's a metaphor we use, and that is, you know, you're walking along a river, you hear a cry for help. There's someone drowning, and you jump in, you pull them to shore, you give them out the mouth resuscitation, you'll save their life. And no sooner no sooner do you do that, and what do you hear? Two more cries for help. And sometimes in business, leaders and, and owners and entrepreneurs are so busy putting out fires, we're so busy pulling people out of the river that we don't go upstream and see who the hell's pushing these people in. And I would say, go upstream, go upstream and look at your policies, your planning, your procedures, and work on your business so there's fewer people to pull out of the river. And I think uh, the third would be, well, first of all, invest in yourself and create, you know, like Buffett said, create the communications and the speaking and so forth um, to, to uh, be successful. And when you do that, and you met, you alluded to this earlier, and that's think both short term and long term. I think so many people are looking at how, what sale can I make today? What impact can I have on our bottom line or for our investors this quarter? I would say skip the short term because people overestimate what they're going to do short term anyway, and they far underestimate what they can do long term. And if you think long term and you balance those two out, um, you're going to be able to filter through vision and strategy and not personality or tactics. So, you know, when you go to the doctor, you don't say, hey, um, what do you have on special today? You allow them to diagnose the problem. You ask great questions. You find out their needs, their wants, their doubts, their fears, their concerns, their family history. And if you commit to having a good bedside manner and ask your clients and your, your, your customers great questions, you're going to be able to diagnose their challenges and then offer a protocol or a prescription that is truly going to make a difference and make meaning in their life, which was part of our passion for creating, creating a great company or business, which we address at the top of the call. So I hope those three will help. Oh, so profound. And I know you're really committed to, to making a difference and, and really amplifying the impact that you can have in the world. Can you, can you share with our listeners what you're, what you're up to next? <laughs> Well, my legacy at this point, Brendan, and thanks for asking, is to work with clients, businesses, entrepreneurs, and speakers who want to make a difference and want to make meaning. If they're if they just sell widgets and they just want to make more money, 
and they just want to tell their story because it makes them feel better about themselves. That's not our the people I want to work with. I believe right now at this point, it's like dropping a stone in the water. I want to have impact or processional effect rather than on one company, on one company or one speaker or one uh, entrepreneur who's making a difference with many, many, many individuals, whether it's improving their health or their wealth or their relationships. So yeah, dropping a stone in the water and impacting companies who are conscious or a desire to be a conscious company who wants to make difference and meaning in the world. Uh, I think you made a very powerful uh, statistic at the top of the call. And that is that the backbone of our countries, uh, the backbone of our economy is based on the efforts of entrepreneurs, small business owners. And we are the people who are going to make a difference. It's not our politicians. Let's face it. <laughs> They're only going to get us in trouble. So yeah, I want to work with people who are making a difference. And that's going to be my legacy at this point. It's no longer about the money. It's about making impact for people who want to make impact. We're absolutely in line on that. And, and I wish you every success with with being a ripple maker. I've I've really loved this conversation today. You've You've just a lovely energy, Scott. I uh, appreciate you showing up so well prepared today. You've delivered so much value. If people want to get in touch with you and learn more about your work, how best to reach you and connect with you? Uh, thanks. The um, I think the best way is to either go to destinytraining.com, which is our website, and you'll find out you know, whether it's business consulting or, you know, public speaking or, you know, private consulting or mentoring or even MC services. That's one place. The other is uh, engagefromyourstage.com. And that's engage from your stage. Because my belief is whether you're a business owner or a speaker, everybody has a stage. And the question is, what are you doing to make the most of your stage to leverage your time to get that one-to-many approach instead of one-to-one? -one? So engagefromyourstage.com or destinytraining.com. Those are both great resources to track us down. And uh, yeah, that's where we can contribute the best. Uh, well, look, we'll, we'll put uh, links to both of those websites on, in the show notes. And you have a book coming out uh, in, the, in the foreseeable future. Can you share a little bit about that? Uh, if you have uh, a release date yet, or you know, can you signpost our listeners to, 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 to a time when they should be looking out for this? Yeah, we're, I'm in the final throes, and I'm, I'm very cautious to give a timeline. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, you know, I would say I'm the author of the upcoming book called Engage. And, you know, our, my belief is that, that uh, when you can engage someone and create a desired feeling, that is when they will take action, they will vote with their dollars, they will march, they will contribute, they will, you know, get to your philanthropic organization, what have you. So it's, it's much of what we've talked about and shared here is where the communication skills, both internally and then one to many that you need to have that will exponentially impact your results whether it's personal professional or in your business so yeah it's going to be called engage and that's you know the ultimate you know guide to the communication skills to uh, cause your audience to feel engaged brilliant well you've certainly engaged me today and I, i've loved i've loved every bit of this conversation i wish you every success with the, with the book when it comes out and with everything you're doing scott um thanks again take care thank you brandon i'm flattered and honored and i appreciate the opportunity to contribute to your guests thank you